it's a pleasure to have Neil Gong from uh, Duke University here today, and he's going to be telling us about secure self-supervised learning. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduction, Thomas, and uh, also for the uh, for inviting me to give this talk. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, as Thomas introduced, uh, I am Neil Gong from Duke University. Uh, today, I will talk about our work on secure self-supervised learning. Uh, as you know, supervised learning is a very popular uh, conventional machine learning paradigm. Suppose we are given a learning task, such as traffic sign recognition. Supervised learning first requires manually labeling a large amount of traffic signs, and then change a classifier. Given another learning task, such as digit recognition, supervised learning first requires manually labeling a large amount of digits and then change the classifier. In supervised learning, this process of manually labeling a large amount of training data and then training a classifier is repeated for each individual task. So the key challenge of supervised learning is that it requires a large amount of labeled training data for every task. Self-supervised learning aims to address this key challenge. Specifically, given a large amount of unlabeled data, self-supervised learning aims to pre-train a neural network, which is known as encoder. The pre-trained encoder is then used as a general purpose feature extractor to build classifiers for different tasks. In particular, given a pre-trained encoder, building a classifier for a task only requires a small amount of, or even no labeled training data. Self-supervised learning has made substantial progress in the uh, past several years, and uh, uh, many encoders have been pre-trained by industries, for instance, CNIP, BERT, GPT, and so on. While there are already many studies on improving the accuracy of self-supervised learning, its security aspect is much less explored. So in this talk, we will focus on the security aspect of self-supervised learning. In particular, we will focus on the security of pre-trained encoders. Moreover, we will focus on pre-trained encoders in the computer vision domain. By analogy to a computer system, a pre-trained encoder is like an operating system of the AI ecosystem. So starting the security of a pre-trained encoder is like an operating system level security of AI. This is a node map of this talk. Uh, in part one, we will discuss our backdoor attack to pre-trained encoders. And in part two, we will discuss data auditing for pre-trained encoders. Let's look at part one first. Before introducing our backdoor tech, I'd like to describe a little bit more background on self-supervised learning. Suppose we're given some unlabeled data, which could be images or image text pairs. These unlabeled data are often collected from the public internet, such as social media sites, Google search, and so on. Given these unlabeled data, Self-supervised learning aims to pre-train an encoder, and the pre-trained encoder is then used as a general purpose feature extractor to build classifiers for different tasks. In self-supervised learning, these tasks are often called downstream tasks, and these classifiers are often called downstream classifiers. Next, I will describe a little bit more details about how to pre-train an encoder from unlabeled data and how to build a downstream classifier from a pre-trained encoder. Data augmentation is a key component of pre-training an encoder. Suppose we're given an image. Data augmentation aims to create random augmented views of this image. For instance, we can crop a random region of the image and then resize it to have the same uh, image size to create an uh, augmented view. 
we can also randomly, we can also flip the image, rotate the image, or use many other operations to create all, uh, random augmented views of the image. Next, let's use SimCLR as an example to illustrate encoder pre-training. Suppose we are given an image. We first use data augmentation to create two random augmented views. We have an encoder. We use the encoder to produce a feature vector for each augmented view. Suppose we uh, give another image. We also create two random augmented views using data augmentation and use the encoder to produce a feature vector for each of them. An encoder is basically pre-trained in a way such that it produces similar feature vectors for two random augmented views of the same image, but these similar feature vectors for two random augmented views of different images. Suppose we're given a set of training inputs of a downstream task and a pre-trained encoder. We first use a pre-trained encoder to produce a feature vector for each training input. These feature vectors and the corresponding labels are then used to build a downstream classifier, for instance, following the standard supervised learning paradigm. Given a test input, we first use the pre-trained encoder to produce its feature vector, and then use the downstream classifier to predict its label. In a backdoor attack to self-supervised learning, an attacker aims to achieve two goals. The first goal is the utility goal, which means that the classification of any clean test input should not be affected by the backdoor attack. For instance, this clean stop sign should still be correctly predicted as a stop sign in our example. The second goal is the effectiveness goal, which means that once we embed a backdoor trigger, for instance, a white square in our example, into any testing input, the classifier predicts an attacker chosen label, for instance, speed and limit in our example. This attacker chosen label is often called target label. Existing backdoor attacks, when applied to self-supervised learning, aim to compromise the downstream classifiers to achieve these two goals. However, these backdoor attacks are not applicable when the process of building a downstream classifier maintains integrity. Our backdoor attack aims to compromise the encoder to, to achieve these two goals. Specifically, given a clean encoder, our backdoor attack called bad encoder transforms it into a backdoor encoder. And when building downstream classifiers based on our backdoor encoder, these downstream classifiers inherit the backdoor behavior simultaneously. For simplicity, let's denote the clean encoder as F and the backdoor encoder as F prime. In our attack, we uh, consider the following threat model. Suppose an attacker aims to attack one target downstream task, for instance, traffic sign recognition. The attacker picks one target label, for instance, speed limit, and one backdoor trigger, for instance, a white square in the center of an image. Our attack can also attack multiple target downstream tasks and multiple target labels simultaneously. But for simplicity, let's focus on just one target downstream task and one target label in this talk. But the result of attacking uh, multiple target downstream tasks and multiple target labels can be found in our paper. An attacker aims to achieve the effectiveness goal and the utility goal. In terms of the attacker's background knowledge, we assume the attacker has access to some unlabeled images, which we call attack dataset. 
the attacker also has access to an image with the target label. For instance, when the target label is speed limit, this image is a speed limit song. We call this image reference image. An attacker can collect the attack data set and the reference image from different sources, for instance, the public internet. The key idea of our attack is to formulate it as an optimization problem. Specifically, we propose an effectiveness loss to quantify the effectiveness goal and an utility loss to quantify the utility goal. Then, given a clean encoder, we generate a backdoor encoder via minimizing a weighted sum of the two losses. Next, let's describe a little bit more details about how to quantify the effectiveness goal and how to quantify the utility goal. The effectiveness goal means any image with the backdoor trigger should be predicted as the target label. Specifically, we first use the backdoor encoder F prime to produce a feature vector for an image with the backdoor trigger. Here, F prime X is a feature vector for an image X produced by the backdoor encoder F prime. Then the downstream classifier should predict this feature vector as a target label which is speed limit in our example. We propose two conditions, satisfying which can achieve the effective scope. The first condition is that the backdoor encoder F prime should produce similar feature vectors for any image with the backdoor trigger and the reference image. The second condition is that the backdoor encoder F prime and the clean encoder F should produce similar feature vectors for the reference image. So the feature vector of the reference image produced by the backdoor encoder F prime is still correctly classified as a target label by the downstream classifier. We can achieve the effectiveness goal by satisfying the two conditions. So Quantifying the effectiveness goal now becomes quantifying the two conditions. We use the following loss term L0 to quantify condition one. <clears throat> Here, DA is our attack data set. F prime is our backdoor encoder. X plus E means embedding the backdoor trigger E into an image X. XR is our reference image. S is a similarity metric used to measure the similarity between two feature vectors. In our experiment, we use cosine similarity. This term is the attack data set size and is used to normalize the similarity scores. Intuitively, the loss term L0 is smaller if the condition one is better satisfied. We use the following loss term L1 to quantify condition two. Again, F prime is the backdoor encoder. F is the clean encoder. XR is the reference image. And S is the cosine similarity between two feature vectors. Intuitively, a smaller L1 indicates that condition two is better satisfied. Finally, we quantify the effectiveness goal using a weighted sum of the two loss terms. Here, lambda one is a hyperparameter used to balance between the two loss terms. Recall that the utility goal means the classification of an image without the backdoor trigger should not be affected by the backdoor attack. To achieve this goal, we want the backdoor encoder F prime and the clean encoder F to produce similar feature vectors for any image X without the backdoor trigger. Formally, we 
use the following loss term L2 to quantify the utility goal. Again, DA is our attack data set, and S is the cosine similarity between the two feature vectors of an image X produced by the backdoor encoder F prime and the clean encoder F. Intuitively, a smaller L2 indicates that the utility goal is better satisfied. Finally, we have the following total loss L, where L0 and L1 quantify the effectiveness goal, while L2 quantifies the utility goal. Lambda 1 and lambda 2 are two hyperparameters used to balance between the three loss terms. Given a clean encoder F, we generate a backdoor encoder F prime by minimizing the total loss L. Moreover, we minimize the total loss L using stochastic gradient descent. In our experiment, we pre-train an encoder using CMCRR and the CEPA-10 data set. We also evaluated our attack on encoders pre-trained on multiple other data set, and the details can be found in our paper. When building downstream classifiers, we consider three downstream tasks, and we adopt a fully collected neural network as a downstream classifier. In our attack, we assume the attack data set is the pre-training data set. The target label is different for different target downstream tasks, and the details can be found in our paper. The reference images were collected from the public internet. The hyperparameters lambda 1 and lambda 2 are said to be 1. We also evaluated our backdoor tag under many other settings, and the results can be found in our paper. Recall that our attack aims to achieve two goals, that is, effectiveness goal and utility goal. We use attack success rate to evaluate whether our attack achieves the effectiveness goal. Suppose we're given some clean testing input. We embed the backdoor trigger into each of them and use the backdoor encoder F prime to produce a feature vector for each of them. And finally, we use a downstream classifier built upon F prime to predict their labels. We define attack success rate as a fraction of the testing input embedded with the backdoor trigger that are, crack, that are classified as a target label, which is speed limit in our example. This table shows the attack success rate of our attack for the three target downstream tasks. Our results show that our attack achieves the effectiveness goal because the attack success rate is close to 100%. We use clean accuracy and backdoor accuracy to evaluate whether our attack achieves the utility goal. Again, suppose we're given some clean testing input. We first use a clean encoder app to produce their feature vectors, and then use a downstream classifier built upon F to predict their labels. Clean accuracy is the fraction of the test inputs that are classified correctly in this way. We also use a backdoor encoder X prime to produce a facial vector for each test input, and then use a downstream classifier built upon F prime to predict their labels. And we define the backdoor accuracy as a fraction of the test inputs that are classified correctly in this way. Our attack achieves the utility goal if the backdoor accuracy is similar to or even higher than the clean accuracy. This table shows the clean accuracy and the backdoor accuracy of our attack for the three target downstream tasks. As we can see from this table, our attack achieves the utility goal because the backdoor accuracy is similar to or even higher than the clean accuracy. We also evaluated our attack on real-world pre-trained encoders. In this talk, I will show you some results on OpenAI's pre-trained encoder called CNIP. 
which was pre-trained on 400 million image text pairs collected from the public internet. We assume the attack data set is the image-less data set, since CLIP's pre-training data set is not publicly disclosed. This table shows the results of our attack for CLIP. First, our attack achieves the effectiveness goal because the attack success rate is close to 100%. Second, our attack achieves the utility goal because the backdoor accuracy is similar to the clean accuracy. We also found that existing backdoor defenses designed for supervised learning are insufficient to defend against our backdoor attack. Specifically, we evaluated both empirical defenses and the provable defense. For empirical defenses, we considered neuroclines and MMTD. For provable defense, we evaluated the patch guard. We found that neuroclines cannot detect our backdoor attack. The detection accuracy of MMTD is close to random guessing, and patch guard has insufficient provable robustness guarantees against our backdoor attack. To summarize a little bit, we found that pre-trained encoders in self-supervised learning are vulnerable to backdoor attack. Insecure pre-trained encoders lead to a single point of failure of the AI ecosystem. And existing backdoor defenses are insufficient to defend against our backdoor attack. So that's uh, part one of uh, this talk. And uh, let's see, do you have any questions about part one? Okay. Hi, uh, yeah. thanks for the nice talk. So I was a little confused. So in your attack, do you retrain the downstream classifiers also? Can you say again? Re retrain the downstream classifier? Yeah, I mean, in the sense you train a separate downstream classifier for F and F prime, is that the case? Right, the the downstream classifier is trained based on the backdoor encoder. So you're assuming you have access to the full classification data set for the downstream task? No, uh, we, we, uh, we didn't make that assumption. So here, the threat model, uh, let me uh, let me give you a uh, let me give you an example where this attack may be applied. Let's see, uh, OpenAI uh, publishes Knip. Okay, I am a third party. I, I download OpenAI's Knip and in, inject my backdoor into Knip, and then I republish the backdoor Knip on GitHub or on on some cloud service where some other countries can access. It. <laughs> and then those customers will download my backdoor clip to train their downstream classifier. And if they use my backdoor clip to train their downstream classifiers, they will inherit the backdoor behavior. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And the other questions? About part one. Okay, yeah, if not, let's move on to uh, part two about uh, <clears throat> data auditing for pre-trained encoders. Recall that in self-supervised learning, a service provider such as OpenAI often collects unlabeled data from the public internet, uses them to pre-train encoders, and then may monetize the pre-trained encoders while deploying them as paid cloud service for the downstream customers. For instance, OpenAI monetizes its GPT models via a paid API service. The price of the API could be as high as $0.6 per 1,000 natural language tokens. So our public data on the internet are used to pre-train encoders and then monetized by service providers, even if we didn't authorize them to do so, nor we get paid. 
This motivates us to start a data auditing for self-supervised learning. In particular, we aim to answer the following question. Was my public data used to pre-train a given encoder without my authorization? Such unauthorized data use actually already happens in the real world and leads to severe legal consequences. For instance, Twitter demanded an AI company stop collecting images from its website. A company called Ever uses its users' images to train face recognition models without the user's authorization. And the FTC orders Ever to delete the trained face recognition models. We propose in CodeMI a membership inference-based data auditing method for pre-trained encoders. Specifically, given an encoder, which we call target encoder, and an unlabeled image, our encoder MI aims to infer whether the unlabeled image was used to pre-train the target encoder or not. If yes, we call the unlabeled image a member of the target encoder's pre-training data set. Otherwise, we call it a long member. In our method, we assume the data auditor has a black box access to the target encoder. Specifically, given any image, we can query the target encoder to obtain its feature vector. Recall that self-supervised learning aims to pre-train an encoder such that it produces similar feature vectors for two random augmented views of an image. Suppose we are given a member image of the target encoder's pre-training data set. We create two random augmented views using data augmentation, and we use a target encoder to produce a feature vector for each augmented view. Suppose we are also given a long member image. We create two random augmented views using data augmentation and use a target encoder to produce a facial vector for each of them. Our key observation is that the target encoder is likely to produce more similar facial vectors for two random augmented views of the memory image, but less similar facial vectors for two random augmented views of the long memory image. Based on this observation, we propose our encoder MI. <clears throat> Suppose we aim to infer the membership status of an image. We first create n random augmented views of the image using data augmentation. And then we use a target encoder to produce a feature vector for each augmented view. And finally, we calculate the pairwise similarity scores between the n feature vectors. In our experiment, we use cosine similarity. Then, based on these pairwise similarity scores, we use a binary classifier, which we call inference classifier, to infer whether the image is a member or non member. As you can see from this pipeline, the inference classifier is a key component of our method. We build an inference classifier via shadow training, which we will discuss next. In our shadow training, we assume the data auditor has access to some unlabeled images, which we call shadow data set. We evenly divide the shadow data set into two halves. One half is called shadow member set, and the other half is called shadow long member set. We first pre-train an encoder, which we call shadow encoder, using the shadow member set. The shadow encoder may have a different architecture from the target encoder. And the self-supervised learning algorithm used to pre-train the shadow encoder may also be different from the one 
used to pre-train the target encoder. Based on the shadow encoder, we construct a training set for the inference classifier. Specifically, for each image in the shadow member set, we first randomly create n augmented views, and then use a shadow encoder to produce their feature vectors. And finally, we calculate the pairwise similarity scores between the n feature vectors. We treat these pairwise similarity scores as the features of this image. Since this image is in the shadow member set of the shadow encoder, we assign label one to it. <clears throat> For each image in the shadow long member set, we also first create n random augmented views and use the shadow encoder to produce their feature vectors and then calculate the pairwise similarity scores between the feature vectors. Since this image is in the shadow long member set, <clears throat> we assign label zero to it. And again, we treat these pairwise similarity scores as the features of this image. Our training set for the inference classifier is basically consisting of these features and the corresponding labels of the images in the shadow member set and the shadow long member set. Based on the training set, we build an inference classifier. Specifically, we consider three ways to build an inference classifier. The first way is to rank the pairwise similarity scores of each image in the training set and train a vector-based classifier. The second way is to directly treat the pairwise similarity scores of an image as a set and train a set-based classifier. And the third way is to calculate the average of the pairwise similarity scores of each image in the training set and build a threshold-based classifier. In particular, a threshold-based classifier infers an image as a member if its average pairwise similarity score is larger than a threshold. In our experiment, we pre-train a target encoder using MoCo, CIFAR 10 dataset, and Resolite 18 architecture. When pre-training a shadow encoder, we use SimCRR, STL10 dataset, and VGG11 architecture. As you can see in our experiment, the pre-training algorithm, the pre-training data set, and the encoder architectures are different for the target encoder and the shadow encoder. The parameter n is set to be 10. We also evaluated our method in many other experimental settings, and the details can be found in our paper. To evaluate our method, we consider 10 thousand ground truth members and 10,000 ground truth long members of the target encoder. We use accuracy as our evaluation metric, which is the fraction of members and long members whose membership statuses are inferred correctly by our method. We also considered precision and recall as our evaluation metrics, and the details can be found in our paper. This table shows the accuracy of our method when using different inference classifiers. As we can see from this table, our method is effective. We also evaluated our method on CNIP, a real-world encoder pre-trained by OpenAI. A key challenge of evaluation on CNIP is how to collect the ground truth members and ground truth long members of CNIP, since it's pre-training data set is not publicly disclosed. However, we know that CNIP uses public data on the internet, such as Flickr. So we collected images from Flickr to construct members and long members of CNIP to evaluate our method. Specifically, we first collected 1,000 images from Flickr and we treat them as potential members of CNIP. We collected another 2,000 images from Flickr, randomly paired them as 1,000 images, 
and we treat these 1,000 images as ground truth LAM members of CNIP. Finally, we use our encoder MI to infer the membership statuses of these potential members and ground truth LAM members. This table shows the accuracy of our method for CNIP when the inference classifiers are trained in our previous experiment. As we can see from this table, our method achieves relatively high accuracy for CNIP. To summarize a little bit, I hope I have convinced you that data auditing is an emerging problem for pre-trained encoders in self-supervised learning. And the feature similarity between augmented views can be used to audit unauthorized data use in pre-trained encoders. Self-supervised learning actually also has many other security issues. For instance, we recently showed that self-supervised learning is also vulnerable to data poisoning attacks. In particular, an attacker can carefully craft some poisoning input and publish them on the internet. When a service provider collects unlabeled data from the internet and uses them to pre-train an encoder, the encoder is poisoned by the attacker. <clears throat> and the downstream classifiers built based on the poisoned encoder will classify attacker-chosen testing input as attacker-chosen labels. <clears throat> we also showed that an attacker can steal a pre-trained encoder, which is deployed as a cloud service via just acquiring the encoder. The stolen encoder has similar utility as the target encoder, but stealing an encoder takes much less data and computation resource than pre-training the encoder from scratch. So to conclude, in this talk, we mainly discussed uh, that pre-trained encoders are vulnerable to backdoor attack and how we can audit unauthorized data use in pre-training encoders. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge my students in this research. So that concludes my presentation. And uh, let's see, do you have any more questions? Yeah, Thomas, go ahead. So you were constructing these non-member classes by combining two images. By combining two images. Are you not worried that because those two images might be members, that there's like enough similarity that this will cause issues? Right. That's a good question. So here, um, so here, I would see uh, by definition of uh, member, this combined or this paired uh, image is a long member with a very high probability. But but actually, I cannot be one hundred percent sure because maybe someone also combined two images and uh, upload them uh, to Flickr. But mm -hmm. I, based on the definition of member. I would see with very high probability, uh, these combined these combined images are ground truth LAM members of CNIP. Yeah, but but you raise a very good point. Based on how we constructed the ground truth LAM members, actually, these LAM members may turn out to have uh, to have a good similarity, right? To have high similarity with those potential member images, because here we can we can uh, we combine these two images. Maybe the feature of this image may, may still be similar to the feature of each individual image. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, so, so what I want to see here is that maybe in real world, okay, if we have really good real world ground truth long members, maybe our accuracy. The, the accuracy of our method may be even higher. Yeah. That, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Same. Yeah, so I guess you, you, yeah, you could only increase the, things would only be better. Yeah, that's nice. Right, sense. right, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs>